I'm a data scientist. Uh, according to the program, I'm a data scientist at Allstate. Uh, that's no longer true as of this past Friday. As of this coming Monday, I'll be a data scientist at Monetate uh, in Philadelphia. Um, the title of my talk is Improving Long-Term MLS Roster Management with Survival Analysis. Uh, that sounds pretty broad. More, uh, more specifically, I'm going to be focusing on uh, the roster management of prospects of, of younger players in the league. And um, more specifically than that, I'm going to be looking at modeling uh, their development timeline and what their development curve looks like, just hopefully get an idea of the time to event from uh, when a prospect joins the league until they become a starter. Um, so that's eventually what I'll get to. Um, so what, why do we care about prospect development? Do, you know, do we care about prospect development um, in MLS? Uh, MLS teams certainly do. So 11 MLS teams have uh, a full USL second team, and uh, the USL is uh, in the second division of the US Soccer Pyramid. Um, for those teams, they, they own and operate the second team, uh, and that serves uh, to some extent like a minor league baseball team would. So a, a place to get players who might not get minutes on the first team, a place to try out players, and also a place to habituate those players to the way of playing that the first team will have. Um, so 11 uh, own and operate their own USL teams. Uh, nine teams have a USL affiliate, so rather than fully owning and operating, they have some sort of relationship with those USL teams. Um, they'll send them players, mostly is what that looks like, to get more minutes uh, that they couldn't otherwise get in MLS. Uh, every team with Minnesota getting their academy up and running this past February, every team now has an academy. Um, and that essentially looks like um, a set of youth clubs, uh, a youth structure. Uh, that fits under the umbrella of the club itself. And um, so I can go all the way down to players as young as eight, uh, maybe younger. Um, and that's a good way to get um, to get youth in uh, and, and also habituate into the way that the first team wants to play. Uh, according to Don Garber, MLS commissioner, more than 50 million is spent on these academies um, by all teams in a year. And so there's a pretty significant investment that's being made to develop younger players. Um, and, and I should say too that this investment is increasing in more recent years. So this, um, this USL relationship, uh, especially owning a full team, is only maybe it's in, a, in its um, fourth year, I think. Um, and so it's, it's something that uh, more money is being put into now. There, there's a bigger push for MLS teams to be able to develop their own players. Uh, and so um, you might think that given this, um, maybe there are more of these players, more younger players coming into the league than in years past because they're spending more money to develop those players. Um, I'm going to take a step back here and talk about um, prospect. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to define it as a player that is 21 or under uh, when they first enter MLS. Um, so it's not perfect. Players come from a diversity of backgrounds. They come to MLS through the draft. Um, they could be a foreign signing from abroad. Um, they could be signed from a USL team. They could be a homegrown. Uh, and that means that uh, those players come to MLS at sort of different stages in their careers. Um, and so, uh, especially for foreign players, for example. A guy like Jefferson Severino is a little bit more of a known commodity than um, a guy who just came out of the draft. And so um, it's not a perfect definition by setting that 21 or under cutoff. Not everyone is in their first few years of professional soccer, but I think it works well. Um, there are probably people, players older than 21 that might still be considered prospects, especially coming out of the draft. Um, players are in their first year of professional soccer, and so uh, players as old as 22 or even 23 might be considered prospects. But uh, I think upping that threshold too much is going to increase the false positive rate more than I'd be comfortable with. And so this actually accounts for about 20% um, of players uh, in a given year might be uh, might be 21 or under. And so that's the definition I'm working with. Um, so like I said, we, we might expect more of these players given the increased uh, investment we're seeing from MLS teams. Um, it turns out that's not the case. So this is um, the number of prospects per team, the number of players 21 and under per team by year. Uh, and I'm doing it per team, right, because we have expansion and contraction. But I think if you look at the raw numbers for this, it's actually ticked down slightly in the last couple of years. Um, it stays pretty flat between about four or five players, maybe, uh, in a given year. Uh, so we're not seeing any more prospects in the league now than we had in years past, in, in spite of this investment. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that, right? MLS teams might not want to devote more roster spots to their prospects um, just because they're developing more of them. Um, and so you might say, so there aren't uh, any more prospects coming into the league, uh, but maybe the prospects that do come in are of higher quality. Um, and uh, here, I'm, when I talk about quality, um, as far as I'm going to define it as a metric, I'm mostly going to be talking about minutes played. Um, and that's not perfect. Soccer doesn't have a great one number metric, like baseball's wins above replacement, for example. Um, so minute, minutes played sort of gets at that. It's not perfect. Um, some teams just can't find a right back, and so they have to play Michael Harrington there, for example. 
um, even though he might not be you know a starter quality player. Um, so minutes played isn't always perfect, but uh, for uh, a mathematical definition, it's going to work okay here. Um, so are we seeing um, the prospects coming into the league? Uh, are they of any higher quality than in years past? Um, and I should say, it's all certain that they're of higher absolute quality. Players joining the league in 2017 at that age are almost certainly better than they were 10 years ago. Um, players 21 and under. Uh, but they're not necessarily playing more minutes. And so this chart shows the percentage of prospects in the league that are playing more than the league average of minutes. And here I'm using the league average as the threshold, but sort of if you put it uh, in anywhere, the 70th percentile, the 30th percentile, uh, we're not seeing any more prospects playing more meaningful minutes than uh, than in years past, or at least not seeing a sustained trend um, in spite of that investment. And, and there are a whole, whole lot of reasons why this might be the case too, right? The general quality of the league um, is improving, so uh, if prospects uh, might be improving absolutely, but they're not improving relatively enough to the quality of the league to get uh, substantial minutes. Um, there's allocation money, which allows MLS teams to buy down sort of their upper and mid-tier players, which uh, gives them greater options for depth. They don't have to just pick um, a few young guys and throw them in just for, for depth just because. Um, and uh, and so I, I think we're probably still years, a few years out before we start to see real dividends on that investment in youth. The other thing too is that this is league-wide, so there are definitely certain teams that are starting to see the uh, benefits of their investment in younger players, um, but that's going to come out the wash here when we look across the league at the percentage of players. Um, so I think this represents an opportunity for growth. We're not seeing any more prospects than years past. Um, we're not necessarily seeing better prospects than years past relative to the league. On the whole, so I, I think this can be improved, and um, I think it, it will improve in the next few years as uh, some of those investments start to get returns. Um, so I want to take a couple minutes now to talk about what typical development, what a um, develop timeline, what a development curve looks like for a player in MLS. Specifically, I want to look at um, the time uh, from the time a prospect joins the league until it becomes starter quality and what that curve looks like, what the probability that, that is happening in year one, what the probability that happens by year two, uh, and so on. Um, I'm going to define starter quality here. Uh, players that play in the 65th percentile of minutes or higher, um, I'm going to say are starter quality, and so that's about nine or ten players per team. If anything, that might be a bit permissive. Uh, maybe we could be a little more restrictive there. Um, I, I'm throwing goalkeepers out because their development curves are going to look substantially different. Um, you can only play one goalkeeper, whereas if you have um, a couple of midfielders that are good, you can find a lineup that, that makes use of both of them. Um, so ignoring goalkeepers, it's at about nine or ten players per team, which maybe is a little high. Um, each team probably has a couple guys that are more like fringe starters that get um, get scenario starts, they get spot starts. Maybe they start uh, half the team's games in the season. Um, but uh, I think I'm comfortable at that level. And the other thing I'm going to do is say that once a player becomes a starter, hits this threshold in a given year, um, henceforth they are considered starter quality. I'm using survival analysis, uh, so there's not going to be any Lazarus effect. A player can't hunt die once he hits starter quality in one year. Um, so this is a, a Kaplan-Meier estimate. Essentially it's the empirical estimate um, for a player's development. Um, so along the x-axis you have the season, uh, year one in the league, year two in the league, and so on. Along the y-axis, um, you have the probability that a player has not yet become a starter by that year. Um, so in year one, um, that's at 90%, which means a player has a 10%, uh, a prospect has a 10% chance of becoming a starter in their first year in the league. Um, at year two, it's about 83%, so a prospect has a 17% chance of having become a starter um, by the first two years in the league. Uh, I think that drops to, uh, or increases to a 23% chance within the first three years, and then it sort of tails off um, around four years, maybe at uh, 70, uh, 28% chance of becoming a starter. Um, so that's what the timeline looks like, just empirically. Uh, I should say I'm using data from 2007 to 2016 um, to, to get this, and that's all pulled up at MLSsoccer.com. Uh, it might be interesting to see what this looks like um, split up by year. Uh, you know, given the increased investment, is the timeline speeding up at all to get from prospect to a starter? Um, so here I'm splitting up 2007 to 2011 uh, versus 2012 to 2016. It's not quite, quite apples to apples because um, people in this 2012 to 2016 cohort have fewer years to develop. Um, so that's going to bias the estimate a little bit, but I think it's okay to, to look at this here. Um, there's a lot of overlap, so it doesn't look like the timeline is significantly different between 2007 and 2011 versus this 2012 to 2016 cohort. 
Um, so, so we're not seeing any, any speed up in the time it takes to become a prospect. Uh, another interesting question might be to look by position um, at what these development curves look like. And so um, here you'll notice that uh, defenders have a, a greater likelihood um, and develop to starter level faster than midfielders, which have a, a greater likelihood uh, of developing to a starter and forwards. Um, I think intuitively this makes sense, um, so it's, it's good to see. Uh, I think MLS teams are much more willing to take a flyer on a young defender in a spot um, than they are a young attacker, right? They, they prefer to spend money on attackers to get someone with a proven goal scoring record, whereas when they're perfectly comfortable sliding a guy like um, Jack Elliott or Alex Granali this year, um, unproven guys, but they just don't have anyone better to put in front of them. So they're okay uh, with that in the roster. So, so this makes good intuitive sense. Good to see if we're not in the data. Um, here to split up by team, it's probably pretty hard to read the graphs. Um, and we're splitting the data up pretty finely at this point. Um, so what a uh, team's development curve might look like can be pretty heavily influenced just by a, a few players. Um, I will call up two. Um, well, um, Seattle Sounders and Sporting Kansas City seem to have a decent track record of developing prospects, and that, and that shows up here. The other thing to point out is that um, these hazards aren't proportional, um, which, will, uh, which will matter for the actual modeling. Um, so uh, I've talked a bit about empirically what this development process looks like. But how do we now model that process um, to get these probabilistic estimates of a prospect's time to starter um, by season? And so hopefully um, you know, we can say, for example, when a player joins a team, we expect them with this probability to be a starter quality player um, within his third year of the league, for example. Um, so that, that's really the end goal is to get these probabilistic estimates. Uh, to sort of quantify what people might already be sort of eyeballing or thinking about in their heads. Um, there are a few considerations to take into account with uh, building a model like this. Um, the biggest one is the presence of informative censoring. So most survival analysis models assume uh, uninformative censoring, meaning that people that drop out of the study uh, do so randomly, that whether they drop out of measurement or not isn't correlated at all. Um, with their probability of dying, or of, in this case, of success. Uh, that is very much not the case in, in MLS. Players that drop out of the league, um, especially prospects that drop out of the league, almost always do so because they're not good enough to get minutes. Uh, so they drop down to USL for a year, or for a few years, or for the rest of their career, they drop down to NASL. Um, Baggio Vesidic is an interesting example of a guy who um, came into the league, played a couple seasons, um, would have been classified as a prospect, wasn't good enough to be a starter, uh, went to Sweden and actually came back and has since become a starter for LA Galaxy. Um, so uh, it's not always the case that a player will drop out and come back in. Um, this was an issue too, this informative sensory uh, in the Kaplan-Meier estimates that I showed earlier. Uh, there I essentially assumed that a player out of the league records zero MLS minutes in a year. Um, and I think that's okay to do, right? A player can drop out, go down to USL, and then come back into into MLS. Um, and if they did come back, so we'd be able to measure them. Uh, they're just out of the league right now, and, and so, you know, out of measurement. But, but we know they're not playing any MLS minutes uh, for certain. Um, and so, uh, essentially, that's how I'm going to handle it, is, is assigning them the value of um, zero minutes in the years they're not in the league. Um, which is, uh, probably has the effect of making some of the survival curves look especially bleak for players, since we're including them in the population. Um, but uh, I think that's okay, right? And there are certain players that can come back. Um, Austin Berry or Quavo Poker might be two good examples of guys who have been uh, at least close to MLS starter quality who might come back into the league and sort of uh, get there again. Um, the other thing to point out is that I'm working in discrete time here. Uh, there's just a maximum of 10 time periods. Um, so uh, we need a discrete time survival analysis model. Um, team effects are sort of interesting. Uh, I showed that they weren't proportional hazards earlier. Um, the other thing is that it's a time-dependent covariant, so a player can come into the league with a team and then switch teams um, during their career. And so um, that's a bit trickier to handle. The other thing is how do we handle that given the way I'm handling the informative sensory? Um, players out of the league don't have a team. And so if we you know, code them as an out-of-league team or something, it's going to be perfectly predictive. So, so we have to work our way around that. Um, I'm actually just going to use the team that a player comes into the league with in the model. Um, and I'm actually, uh, there are some runtime issues with um, the algorithm I'm using to actually train the model for categorical variables with too many levels. And so it'll blow up if you give it a, 
categorical with 22 levels. Um, so I, actually, I'm going to choose to model as a random effect, um, which I think is OK here, actually. Um, essentially, it's going to affect the baseline hazard for our model um, for players. Uh, and I think that makes sense, right? A player that comes up through, uh, especially for like academy players, players that come through the LA Galaxy Academy will probably have similar development timelines to other players that came up through the, through the academy. It's probably less true, uh, less accurate for players that are drafted, and even less accurate for players that are signed from abroad. Um, but uh, I think it's an OK uh, assumption to make. Um, and it, it doesn't make it into the model anyway. So. Um, the other uh, time dependent covariate is age. Um, and uh, I'm actually just going to use entry age in the model, so the, how old a player was when he entered the league model. Um, as far as other methodologies, so the other variables included are homegrown flag, whether the players are homegrown, uh, draft pick flag, whether they were drafted, um, a value for the actual draft pick they went, which is going to be coded to zero if they weren't drafted, um, uh, whether a USL2 team was available for the team at the time of, um, or sorry, whether a USL second team was available uh, at the time the player joined that team, uh, and then uh, try out uh, position two since we've seen that those hazards are mostly proportional. So the final model form, or the model form we're going to be trying out, is a discrete time Cox proportional hazards model. It'll be a frailty model so long as um, the random effects for team are included. Uh, and for future selection, we're doing uh, tenfold cross validation, um, cross validation as well to estimate the out of sample concordance, which is going to be my evaluation metric. Um, concordance really speaks to how well we can sort our risk. It's essentially like AUC. Uh, so it's not necessarily perfect because ultimately I'm going to be adding a baseline hazard to this uh, to this model uh, beneath the Cox proportional hazards model. Um, so there's probably a uh, better metric in there to use. So I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on that. Um, but for now, I'll be using concordance for, for actual variable uh, selection. Uh, and so here's how the model shakes out. Uh, concordance is 0.68, so it's better than a coin flip, which would get uh, 0.5. Um, in the 0 0.6, 0 0.7 range is reasonable for survival analysis models for sort of difficult to model phenomena. So I, I'm decently happy with that. Um, here are the variables that make it in. So there's uh, position, draft flag, draft pick, um, entry age, and then homegrown flag, uh, as well as the, the coefficients, or the transformed coefficients. Um, so that's going to be the proportion by which we multiply the hazard in a given period. Um, so for homegrowns, um, what this means is that a homegrown is 89% uh, more likely than non-drafted, non-homegrown players in a given year um, to become a starter, to be to qualify as a starter. Um, for entry age, uh, this makes good intuitive sense too. Um, the older a player is when they join the league, the more likely they are to be a starter in a given year. Um, picks, the lower the pick, um, the more likely they are to be a starter. The draft flag um, looks pretty high, but uh, really the it's a cumulative effect between that and the pick number. Um, and so it turns out that a pick that goes about 21st or 22nd is about as likely as a homegrown player to become a starter in a given year. Include those effects together. And then defenders, which are the base level here, are, uh, or the base level for this categorical, are more likely than midfielders, um, are more likely than forwards to become um, to become a starter in a given year, which we saw um, from the capital my estimates. Um, I should say, you know, the model's not super accurate. Um, I'm okay with that. I think um, with the data that's available to a club, they would be able to build something much better. Um, I'm mostly concerned with sort of uh, demonstrating the efficacy of this approach, with showing that it's a workable framework um, and that it can be beneficial. So, so given that, you know, I'm happy with model performance um, and with how simple it is. Just a few variables. All of those variables are um, available at the time a player actually joins the league. Uh, so um, that seems. That seems like a good thing. Um, so how did this actually get used in practice? Um, I'll walk through just a quick case study of how I might envision it being used. Um, so DC United has two young midfielders on their team, uh, Chris Durkin and Ian Harks. They're both homegrowns. Um, Chris Durkin has been in the league for two years now. Ian Harks' is first year is this year. I'm going to pretend like I'm looking at those two players prior to the start of the 2017 season. Um, and uh, DC United's team in general needs um, some work. So it might be an open question of whether they need to add um, central midfield pieces where these two players play, whether they need to add central midfield players um, just for the short term, or whether they need to still think about long-term players, um, even though they have two prospects, sort of as a way to hedge their bets on, uh, on the development of these two guys. Um, so you put them into the model. Um, the baseline hazard here is the Kalb-Fleisch-Prentice uh, baseline hazard, which is sort of canonical for a discrete time survival analysis. 
Um, so that's what I'm using here. And then uh, you can combine these. So this is the survival curve for the probability that at least one of them becomes a starter. Um, I also looked at the probability that both of them became, would become a starter, and that was pretty bleak, so I thought this would be more interesting to share. Um, and so uh, if you look, there's about a 15% chance by this model that um, at least one of Harks or Durkin will be a starter within the first three years in the league. Um, knowing what we now know, it looks like Dean Harks is going to be a starter this year. Um, but uh, it's interesting to think about the probabilistic estimate uh, nonetheless. I should say, too, uh, I'm assuming those two curves are independent when combining them. Um, that's probably not the case, right? Um, they don't play exactly the same position, but uh, it could be the case that they'll take minutes from each other um, uh, in a season. And so that would um, bias this estimate. Um, the other thing is that the, the team effect of DC United, if DC United is um, better at developing their prospects than the average team, um, this will be a bit of an underestimate as well. Um, so I've treated them as independent, but uh, that's not necessarily the case. Um, a few other thoughts on other applications. Um, I think, I'll speak to the third bullet point, um, this sort of thing could get applied to other similar applications. So maybe instead of looking at the time from a player joining the league until they become a starter, look at the back end. Um, say you've signed you know, 34-year-old Kaka, how long does he have left in the league before he can't give you a starter number of minutes? Um, I thought it'd be cool to apply something like this in academies. Um, looking at the Kaplan-Meier estimates could give you a good estimate of a sort of a thermometer on the health of the academy. Are your cohorts moving through from U13 to U17, for example, um, at the rate you would expect them to or at the rate you would like them to? Um, I thought it'd be cool too to use like coaching written evaluations or scouting evaluations. Just throw those into like a, uh, an LDA and then take the topics that result and uh, add those covariates in the model. Could be something neat. So. Um, and then um, prospect acquisition too. If you can get an accurate enough model, um, that can inform, um, can inform draft picks. Um, if you need a player to start right away, then uh, you can have a good idea of what the likelihood of that is. Um, whereas if you are comfortable taking a player and allowing him to develop, um, that can inform that as well. Uh, maybe especially for expansion teams who just need players on their roster rather than to fill any specific needs. Um, a few links, um, all the code uh, and the data is up on GitHub, um, so you can check that out. I'll get the slides up there shortly. Um, a few other people have done similar, anal similar analyses. There's one on baseball, on um, career lifespans in the 1900s, one on uh, NFL career lifespans. Um, this last one here is interesting. It's a link to an abstract for a paper that will be presented at KDD this year. Um, and it's people, uh, it's a, the authors um, doing essentially what I just did, but applying it in the workplace. Um, so the probability someone who uh, joins a company becomes a manager or uh, gets a raise or a promotion in the next four or five years, which seemed interesting. So if you happen to be a KED, um, that might be that might be something interesting to look at. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, questions? Okay, I, I, I may be showing my lack of knowledge of MLS here, but um, do you think that you you showed in your in your uh, slide there that it seemed as if there were prospects were developing perhaps a little quicker in more recent years. Did I read that correctly? Um, no, or slower. Yeah. Not not necessarily the case. Um, okay, can't necessarily tell whether they are. Developing. Well, sorry. My question was: Has the changing like designated player rules, which I would imagine has created I guess less spots probably for prospects, how might that uh, I guess affect your estimates here? Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, and. Um, less the well, it doesn't mean players, right? If so, if they were to increase, if they were to go a fourth DP slot, that's one less slot that's going to be going to a young guy. Um, but the salary cap also means that, um, well, the salary cap is less effective for DPs, but they're still going to need cheap young guys on on minimum salaries to fill out their positions. Um, I think it's more important looking at money coming into the league, so GAM and PAM, which allows you to buy down um, people in a higher salary, so DP slots, for example. Um, means that um, a team will have more um, more space to spend on mid-level guys, which could crowd out prospects uh, sort of at the bottom. Um, any consideration in terms of um, how good a team a prospect is playing for? Um, you know, I'd imagine uh, teams that are on the uh, positive side of the standings uh, probably have better, tend to have slightly more established players. 
So it might be less likely for a prospect to be able to fight for time in that situation. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good thought. And that would be a way to get around sort of worrying about um, passing just the categorical for a team, right? You could use um, how good the team is. You could use uh, sort of some measure of like historical propensity to, to develop prospects. Um, that's, pro that's probably a play here, yeah. Uh, I didn't look at it yet, but it would be something to go to for the future. And the other thought was, uh, was there no significance to having a USL team? Is that what I um, Yeah, um, uh, neither s uh, statistical significance uh, nor an improvement to, to concordance. Um, but it, uh, the flag isn't for whether they played with the USL team, just for whether there was one that existed. Um, so that's going to be correlated to with strength of the team, right? Um, the Toronto FCs and LA Galaxies of the world have these second teams. And, um, teams lower on the road might not necessarily. Do we have any other questions? You all good? Okay. Well, great. Um